So today we're going to be looking at our module one lecture. Um, so the main part of our lecture is looking at the purposes and functions of art, but we're also going to be looking at the beginning of our lecture at how we can go about defining that term art and is the term art a definable word. Okay, so um, when we think about a work of art, um, your textbook gives us this definition that art is a visual expression of an idea or experience that is formed with skill through the use of a medium. So if we think about that word media or medium, um, this is the actual material that's being used in a particular work. So in the case of the work that we're looking at here, Her Secret in Patience, we are looking at um, a mixed media piece where the work is using steel poles and fiber and light all working together to create this cactus flower um, which served as the symbol for the city this piece was located in, which was Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, so how do we define the term art? So for a lot of people, they think about media or the medium of a piece. They think that art can be a painting or a sculpture, um, but art can also be things like dance and poetry and literature. Um, these are all different types of media. Now, when we think historically about the definition, um, you'll see that defining the term art is very hard to do because everybody has a different kind of interpretation of the word. Um, and so when we look at these next two definitions from historical figures, you're going to see that there are some things that like maybe I personally like about the definitions. There are some things that I don't like about the definitions. Um, and there's also a video linked in Canvas in your lecture notes um, that is it's about a 15 minute video that walks you through dozens of historical definitions. Um, and I highly recommend watching that. Okay, so here we have a definition from William Rubin. Um, or it's really more of a comment on art. Um, so Rubin was an American art scholar. He was an art historian and critic. Um, and he says that there's a consensus as to what art is in most periods, formed by those deeply concerned with the substance of art. This is not elitist, because anyone may participate. Basically, the larger public makes a subjective determination, I know art when I see it. And I think that last sentence, I know art when I see it, is a very popular one. Um, because people may have a hard time defining the term art itself, um, but people feel like they can identify it. Um, and so that's one really cool thing about his comment here. Um, I think historically there is a consensus to um, art and different movements. You have outliers that don't conform to that, but we generally see a consensus. Um, the one issue that I do have with this particular statement is the comment that this is not elitist. Um, because anyone may participate. Because historically, the art world has this kind of notion and this um, characteristic of being an elitist group. Um, and not everyone gets to participate in that. Um, so I think there's some issues with that part of his definition. And next we've got the American painter and photographer Richard Prince. And he stated that I've always said art is a revolution that makes people feel good. I don't think art has a consensus. I don't think 10 people in a room talking about art could agree about whether something is good or bad art. Um, and I really like his the, the kind of central comment here that I don't think art has a consensus. I don't think 10 people in a room talking could agree um, and that, historically, I've seen in my classes is 
when I ask students to give their definitions of art, um, if I have 30 students in a room, I'm going to get 30 different definitions because everybody has a different idea of what art is um, because it's purely subjective and it's based on your history um, and your kind of feelings about art. So I, I really like the way that he states that. I think art very much can be a revolution, and it is in most contexts. It doesn't necessarily have to make you feel good, though. Um, art can make you think critically. It can be emotion-driven. It can it can kind of push you to the point of tears. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a feel-good thing when it comes to art, but art is very much a revolution. Um, so throughout my years of teaching, I've had students give me their definitions of art at the beginning of the semester. And these are some that I've seen pop up multiple times and they're very, um, these are really well kind of thought out definitions. And so I want to kind of touch on each of these. So the first one we have is the cool thing about art is that it can touch anyone, even if you have a language or cultural barrier. And I love this definition because it's very true. When you're walking through major museums in big cities uh, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York or in the Louvre in Paris or at the British Museum in London, what you're going to see walking through that space is doesn't people from dozens of different countries and backgrounds and it's really cool that even you you could have two people looking at a painting that do not speak the same language but they're both interacting with that work um so it really has art has this way of kind of crossing those cultural barriers the next definition is art gives perspective and hope um i love this this is a bit more of a 20th century, 19th, late 19th, 20th century definition, but it's still very much true and relevant in the art world today. Um, the same goes with the next definition. So art is a way of way that people can express themselves. So historically, during the Renaissance, um, during the Baroque, well into the 18th century, art isn't necessarily a form of self-expression. But when we get into the 19th century, and especially in the 20th century, we see artists starting to use their media as a way of expressing their thoughts, their feelings, their emotions. Um, and so we see this definition really coming true, and it's still true today. The next two kind of go hand in hand. So we have art is an important part of society that molds future generations. And then art is not only a form of expression, but also an invaluable window to the past. So if you think about maybe your history classes in college or in high school, a lot of times your professors would use um, paintings to illustrate significant moments in history. Um, so it's providing us this window and kind of telling us the story of the past. Um, and that's a really powerful thing to be able to look to art as a way of kind of giving us this window into our history um, in the world. So what is art? Um, art is something that is directly tied to our culture. Um, it can ask questions about who we are and what we value. Um, it is an expressive medium, or it can be, um, if that's the style an artist is working in. And it allows us as the viewer to experience intense emotions or to think critically. So we could feel things like sorrow or confusion or um, immense joy, but we could also look at a work that maybe changes our perspective on something. And it allows us to kind of think harder about a specific subject. Um, so I have this book from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's a book that's titled Art Is, dot, dot, dot. And so what it is, is the entire book is this series of Art Is statements. Um, and then each statement is paired with a work from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, their catalog of works. So we're going to look at a couple 
um, of these art is statement. So the first is that art is a story and that art can tell a story. So what we're looking at here is a painting by Jacques-Louis David and it's entitled The Death of Socrates. So Socrates was um, executed by an Athenian court for the crime of impiety. So his behavior towards the gods was judged to have been irreverent. And so what we're looking at in the composition here is we're seeing this story being told in front of us. Um, we can have stories that are told that are historical, but we can also have stories told that are mythological. And we'll see that throughout our course. Next, we have art is an impression. So here on the right, you're looking at a painting by Impressionist artist Claude Monet. Um, and this is his bridge over a pond of water lilies from 1899. So this is when the artist is working at his home in Giverny, which is right outside of Paris. He's set up residence. He's built this beautiful home and garden space. Um, and you can see by comparing this to the photograph on the left, he's pulling literal inspiration from his home and the garden that he created. So the photograph on the left is a photograph that I took several years ago at Giverny. And you're seeing this direct influence from nature, um, from his property in his paintings. And we see that kind of pop up again and again in his works. So art is symbolic. So here we're looking at a pectoral and necklace with this pendant. Um, this, this is from Egyptian culture. And what we're seeing here is we have different um, motifs that are very important um, to Egyptian royalty. So we have falcons, which are the symbols of the sun god. We have, um, let's see, a, the clasp. This circular part of the clasp here is a hieroglyph that means encircled. Um, and so diff we have art that can serve as a symbol for us um, to kind of, again, look into the past. We actually see that again in this work, which is art is a record. So this is a stele. Um, we see steles in ancient Mesopotamia and ancient, ancient Egypt. And steles are a form of keeping records. So each of these, let's see, each of these lines that's running up and down is telling us something. And I believe in this particular context, we're looking at a record of the, the goods and offerings that have been brought um, to the ruler. Okay, so next what we're going to do is we're going to break art into three major categories. So the first is fine art. When we look at fine art, we're typically talking about works of art, things like paintings, sculptures, um, printmaking. So that's what we're seeing on the image to the far right. This is an, I believe this is an engraving by Albrecht Dürer. It could also be things like photography. Um, we see photography coming in in the 19th and 20th century as a fine art media. Um, and so when we're categorizing works as fine art, these are the media that tends to be categorized that way. Next, we have craft, and craft is referring to objects that have a utilitarian or everyday purpose. So things like ceramics, um, glass is always associated with craft art, metal, handmade furniture, leather goods, um, embroidery, and anything to do with textiles is typically um, denoted as craft art. And so when we're looking at this particular piece, we're looking at a work by Peter Volkus, who is a ceramicist known for his abstract kind of expressionist works. While we're, the title is clearly Untitled T-Bowl, 
we're not looking at a piece that you would actually drink tea out of but because of the material because we're looking at a ceramic piece we tend to lean um, in categorizing works like this as craft. We see that also in Dale Chihuly, um, who is an American glass artist who creates these monumental, ma magnificent pieces of from hand-blown glass. This particular work is 43 feet tall and contains more than 3,200 pieces of red, yellow, and blue glass. So because this is glass, we would typically place it in the craft category, even though it doesn't serve any sort of everyday purpose or function. Um, and there's a big kind of tension in the art world um, in the last, we've seen this in the last 20 or so years, between these kind of classifications of fine art and craft art. Um, because when you label something as craft art, it inherently has this idea that it's of lesser value, um, which is in no way true. Um, works by people like Peter Volkes and Del Chihuly are just as valuable, and they're just as important in, the, in art history and um, in, in history in general as a painting or a sculpture would be. Our last category is folk art, and this traditionally refers, this is about the artist specifically. So this is referring to someone who has no formal training in art. So someone who is a self-taught painter or sculptor, so they either haven't been to school or they haven't served as like an apprentice under another artist. Um, and a great example of that is Grandma Moses, um, who did not begin painting until she was in her 80s. Um, so she had no formal training, but by the time she died, she was actually a household name in the United States because her paintings had been reproduced on greeting cards and curtains and all sorts of things. Um, and her art draws its power from this kind of freshness and vitality, and she's using her painting is a way to revisit her past. So her works tend to be these beautiful representations of the town that she grew up in. So there's one thing we haven't talked about yet, and that is architecture. So where would architecture fit within these three categories? So we traditionally, so if you think about the way we've defined the categories, architecture would fit in craft right because it's a it serves a purpose it serves a function it's a it's a building that people go into um however we tend to associate architecture as a fine art um that's the, the kind of way historically that we've seen it and we see that in notre dame um, which is in paris which um, is a magnificent kind of space to walk through. And I think partially we see architecture as a type of fine art because the, of the monumentality of works or buildings like Notre Dame um, and other medieval and Gothic churches and structures and like things like the Colosseum and all of that. Okay, so art is all around us. And when you really begin to look, you're hopefully throughout our course, you're going to start noticing um, that art is in our world um, intrinsically. So we can see art in places like coffee shops and antique stores, restaurants, um, doctor's offices. We see art reproduced on things that we might have in our home. So things like a coffee cup with Andy Warhol's Campbell's tomato soup can reproduced on it. Here we've got a backpack which has Vin Vincent Van Gogh's almond blossom reproduced on it. Shoes and clothing. So the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam did a collaboration a few years ago with Vans where they reproduced, a, I think it was six Van Gogh paintings on six different style of Vans shoes. We have things like posters, 
But what about things like magazine covers? So here we're looking at a cover, I believe from 2017, um, of Rihanna on the cover of Vogue Arabia. So would this be considered art? Um, the answer to that would be yes. So we have a photographer, so this would fall under the photography category, um, who is creating this space. You also have an artistic director that's coming up with the kind of the theme and scouting locations and whatnot. Um, but this cover is also inspired by another work of art. And we see that with the bust of Nefertiti, um, who is an Egyptian queen um, and the wife um, of an Egyptian pharaoh. So she is one of the icons of Egyptian um, history. And so we can see a clear um, kind of correlation between the headpiece that Rihanna's wearing and the headpiece in this particular uh, bust that we have of Nefertiti. Um, next, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a series of works. Um, and I want you to think about, I'm going to give you a little bit of time before I move through each, but I want you to think about, are each of the images on the screen here labeled A through F, um, are they in fact works of art? Um, so just take a couple of seconds and look at each of these um, images and kind of make a determination for yourself. Do you think um, each is a work of art? Um, and what, um, yeah, so I'm going to give you just a second, if you want to pause the video here, um, so that you can maybe think about them a little more in depth, you're more than welcome to do that. Okay, so let's look at A. Um, so would this be considered a work of art? Um, what if I told you that the the artist that is credited for this work um, rarely actually physically touches the works that his name is part of? He creates, what if he creates the design, he works out the scale and the model and all of that, but then he has a group of assistants that does a lot of the kind of grunt work. Would that change your idea on whether or not this is a work of art? So here we're looking at the um, sculpture Michael Jackson and Bubbles by Jeff Koons. So Koons is an artist who is working in New York um, throughout the 1980s. He's actually still working today. Um, and he creates these um, large scale sculptures that are very kind of shocking to the viewer. Um, so with a work like this, he's chosen Michael Jackson, a very much in the 1980s, a pop icon um, and the king of pop. Um, and he's paralleling him here um, in the way that we see Christian icons historically throughout the medieval period and well into the Renaissance um, as he's holding his uh, chimp bumble, bubbles. So it's got this kind of composition similar to Michelangelo's Pietà, which is a sculpture group where Mary is holding the dead body of Christ after he's been taken from the cross. Okay, so next, uh, with B, um, what do we think? Do we think this is a work of art? Um, a lot of times people want to say no, um, but it is in fact a work of art. So this is by Marcel Duchamp, who is an artist who's basically spent his career shocking viewers with the works that he would create. Um, so this was part um, of an exhibition that was staged at the Grand Central Palace in New York, and it was an exhibition put on by the Society of Independent Artists. Um, and they, when they sent out the call, um, they basically stated that anyone who submitted a work would be accepted as long as they paid the fee for the show. Um, and as a result, we see Duchamp's fountain placed within the show. Um, 
briefly, but it is it does at least start in the show. Um, so this is in fact a urinal that Duchamp picked up somewhere, likely like at a local hardware store. Um, he's placed it on his side, on its side, and he's signed it with this kind of sloppy signature R. Mutt, which was a pseudonym for Duchamp. Um, and he's taken an object out of context, um, and he's turned it into an art object. And what we see with this particular piece is the beginning of a movement known as the Ready Made. And Duchamp is credited with creating this movement. Um, and we'll be we'll see throughout the 19 teens with Duchamp um, and the Dada movement, well into um, artists like Andy Warhol, where they take objects, they reconfigure them, um, and so they change their function. And as a result, we have a new movement. This is actually a work of art in two ways. Um, because we have Fountain, but we also have the photograph here by Alfred Stieglitz, who is a um, prominent photographer in New York. This was photographed in Stieglitz's studio. Um, and this is the only record that we have of Fountain. So after the show, it was taken down during the show. And then afterwards, we don't really know what happened to the piece. Um, so this is the only living record that we have of Duchamp's work. Okay, so next we have this photograph. So what are we? What do we think we're looking at here? Um, hopefully you noticed a trend. Um, and so this is a work of art. Um, this is by Andy Warhol, and it's his collection of Campbell's soup can screen prints. Um, so we have 32 canvases here measuring 20 by 16. Um, and this is, there is a painting for each of the 32 varieties of Campbell's soups um, that were available in the 1960s. So Warhol began his career as a commercial illustrator. Um, and then he, in the 60s, kind of dived into the art world. Um, and... With, uh, with Warhol, um, what we see is we see him working with a studio. So he has a lot of assistants helping him create these screen prints. Um, and screen prints are a, a type of print where we have multiples. So there could be five of a print. There could be 50 of a print. Um, it just depends on the particular work. And we'll talk more in depth about screen prints um, as we get later into the semester. Okay, so next we've got this piece. A lot of students will mistake this for a painting. It's actually a photograph um, of an earthwork, which is titled Spiral Jetty. So an earthwork um, is a sculpture that's constructed with the earth. It's very literal. Um, so we have Spiral Jetty, which is in, located in the northeastern shore of the Great Salt Lake in Utah, and it's made entirely of mud, salt crystals, and rocks. It is 15 feet wide, and it's 1,500 feet long, and it's jutting from the shore out into the lake. So as you can imagine, this is actually work that, um is not always visible depending on the water levels within the salt lake. It may be completely covered and submerged or it can be fully open and invisible like we're looking at here in the photograph. So this piece is actually part um, of the Dia Foundation, which is, they manage a series of earthworks in the Utah and Arizona and Nevada um, states. So with this piece, we have an idea also of conservation um, because as you can imagine with water levels kind of ebbing and flowing and rising and falling um, there's been some issues with the work kind of falling apart and having some degradation to the piece um, and so there's been talks about should we go in should we shore up the sides and kind of re-add mud and rocks and things 
Um, but Smithson was also a believer in the fact that the work is part of nature and that it should eventually go back to nature if that's what happens. Um, so the next piece here, so would this be a work of art? What about if I showed it to you in this context? Would you still think it's a work of art? I think for some people it absolutely would be. Um, and so this is a coffee mug that was at some point available for purchase at Anthropology, but it's by the artist Molly Hatch. So Hatch is a well-known contemporary ceramicist, um, and she has worked with companies like Anthropology, where she will create this mug. She creates a, a the actual a well a version of this in her studio. She throws the mug on her wheel. Um, she glazes it. She paints. Um, in this case, we're looking at a llama. Um, and then she'll send the completed piece to Anthropology, where they figure out the manufacturing of the piece. Um, but by doing something like this, it allows her to also focus on her um, more kind of original works. Um, and this we're looking at, what we're looking at here is called Psychic Garden. Um, and this is a piece that's actually in Atlanta at the High Museum of Art. It was commissioned for their entryway. So when you walk in the front door, this is immediately to your left, um, like you're going to the bathroom or to the coat check. And what we're seeing here is a series of plates that have this paint, this floral motif painted on them. Um, each of the plates is handmade, um, and each of the plates was hand painted. And what Hatch did was she took a botanical print from the 18th century she blew it up and she made adjustments to it. Um, and then she painted it on each, uh, or pieces of it on each of the plates. And see, our last work here um, is, and I don't have a identifying slide, but what we're looking at here um, is a fashion show by Alexander McQueen. Um, so McQueen's works, uh, when he was living, he, um, he has since passed, these are very theatrical performances um, with each of his fashion shows. So the garments themselves are art, but so is the actual show itself. So he would construct the the stage how the art the um, audience would sit around the stage the lighting the music he had his hand in each element of this production and so it's almost like this 15 minute um, piece of performance art in and of itself um, I believe the two garments we're looking at here are from the 2011 um, I could be totally wrong on that um, collection um, so fashion can be art. Um, it, that is definitely a subjective, um, feeling though. Okay. So now we're going to look at some purposes and functions of art. So, <coughs> so things that questions that we get asked a lot is why should you care about art? What does it serve a purpose in our everyday society? Um, and the kind of short answer to that is absolutely it does. Um, so we're going to start here with a four inch tall figure um, of a nude woman that we call the Venus of Willendorf. This is actually a work that we don't know the, we, we're not 100% we're not confident on the purpose of this work. But this is one of the oldest known art objects that we have. And because of other styles of objects that are similar, we can um, hypothesize the function of this. So with, with the Venus being four inches tall, this would have been an icon that someone could have held in their hand, a very tactile object. We have dozens of these um, reproduced over a th thousands of years. Um, so we see these kind of pop up and... 
the title is kind of telling us what the hypothesis for this icon is. So she's called the Venus of Willendorf. Venus is the goddess of love and fertility. And then Willendorf is the town that she was the in Austria that the object was found in. So historians have speculated that the Venus of Willendorf is used as a fertility icon to bless a couple with an heir. Um, and so that's why we have, we've named her Venus. Um, and she's something that can be held. She can be carried. Um, so very much a kind of object that would have traveled with a couple. Our next work um, is, again, a way that we can see records that have been kept or maybe stories that are being told. So we're looking at the Lascaux Caves in Lascaux, France, which were discovered in the 1940s and they were sensationalized in the art world with history and archaeology. Um, and so what we're seeing here is a collection of cave drawings. There are more than 2,000 figures, which are categorized into three main groups of animals, human figures, and then we have abstract symbols. In the um, kind of snapshot that I have on the screen here, we're looking primarily, um, if not entirely, at animals. Um, we don't know the full context for the case. We don't know if these are maybe drawings that were given up as offerings to maybe bless a hunt that was going to happen. They could actually be a history and a telling of a hunt that's happened. Um, they could have been a way of keeping records. There's a lot of kind of unknowns with objects that are dated this far back into history. So next we're looking at two works that serve an everyday function. So we have um, Sauce Boat with Ladle, where the artist has taken a traditional sauce boat, which is elongated, um, and she's raised the, the edges and brought them up to meet at the top. So we're almost left with this basket-like shape. And then in the image on the right by Nakashima, we're looking at a chair. Um, a chair that by all looks really should not work. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like it would function and be able to hold somebody up. Um, however, it, it absolutely does. And we're seeing in both of these contexts where artists are taking an everyday object and recreating it in this um, radical way. And they're creating these functional art pieces. Another functional art piece is a this work, um, The Barnes Doll House by Frank Lloyd Wright. And shelter is a basic human need. Um, and so we see with architects like Wright, um, these beautiful homes that have been, every kind of attention has been paid to highlight different attributes um, and the style that the architect is working in. But at the end of the day, it does serve this function as a place, as a home, as a residence for someone. So next here, we're looking at a work of art that can hold power. Um, so this is a portrait of Henry VIII. This is a larger than life-size portrait where he is posed without any of the kind of standard royal accoutrements. We don't see um, a scepter. We don't see a crown. Um, so there's nothing um, off kind of at first glance indicating to us that we're looking at a ruler. But Hoblin is able to successfully convey the kind of royal majesty without these props. Um, so he's standing in this very stiff, very stoic pose. Um, his, you can see that his, you've got one hand kind of at his hip. The other hand is pulled up slightly, clenching a, um, a glove. He is adorned with jewels. Um, we see the piece here that is holding this kind of fur piece around his neck. He's also wearing rings on both hands. We do see a hint just slightly 
um, below his left hand um, of a sword. Um, and he's surrounded, I mean, he's clearly dressed in this very, these very lavish garments, um, which are indicating to us potentially money, but also that he is a ruler or leader. Another purpose and function that this work is serving as a way of propaganda to, in, which is, was designed to enhance his role within the court and as the ruler. So this piece deliberately kind of skews Henry's figure to make him look more imposing than he actually would have. Um, and we see in surviving and other surviving works of Henry VIII um, that he, he's shown much taller. Um, this is actually a cut down piece of a larger painting. And he's shown taller than he was. He's also shown as young and full of health. When in reality, he was in his 40s. And he had been badly injured a year earlier in an accident. So he would not have necessarily looked kind of this full of health and strength. Um, and he's had several health problems by the time we're getting to this painting. Um, so we're seeing a piece that is not necessarily a 100% accurate representation of a ruler. And you're going to see throughout our course um, that that is a common theme. Um, we really don't know with these historical figures like Henry VIII, like Louis XIV, or um, Napoleon Bonaparte, the, their portraits, we don't know if those are actual um, accurate representations. And it's likely I would suppose that those are not. Um, because what you're doing is you're showing the figure, the artist is showing whatever ruler they're painting or sculpting in their best light possible. Um, they're showing them full of strength and power because that image is supposed to convey the throne and the role that they hold within, um, the different societies. Okay, so next we have the Taj Mahal, which was built as a commemorative piece. Um, so it was built to commemorate the Shah Jahan and his favorite wife who died in childbirth. He was fraught after her death and he sought a way to commemorate her. And so he built this lavish um, architectural space where we have the structure of the Taj Mahal, but we're also the entire building is surrounded um, by these beautiful garden spaces as well. Another form of art as commemoration, but also art as um, that has a way of touching our emotions um, is Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial um, in Washington, D.C. Um, so the memorial was paid for with the, helps, with the help of donations from the American people. And the government donated the land um, on the mall in Washington, D.C. for the work. And so there was a committee of this team of elite artists and art historians and art critics and whatnot who were assembled to judge submissions and so they sent out a call across the country for submissions for artists to kind of propose their idea of how the memorial should look they received roughly 1400 submissions um and they decided on maya lens um so for lynn her concept here is a visual poem um, so you can see kind of a, a larger scale where we see the whole monument here. Um, and then here is a zoomed in view. So she was asked in an interview what her intent for the piece was. And she actually said that they'll cry. That when people visit the memorial, that they're going to be surrounded by this ghostly silence. Um, and that it's going to evoke our emotions. So the piece, um, and you can see roughly here, um, the work is made of black granite. 
um, and each panel is inscribed with the names of servicemen and women who either died during the Vietnam War or were considered missing in action. So there are more than 60,000 names um, on this piece as a whole. And so when you walk through the space, it is very, you, you really feel the weight um, of those names. And I really, this is one of the kind of purposes for Lynn is she's wanting you to feel the weight and the impact of this war and the cost of it by looking and seeing the hundreds and thousands of names on each of these marble pan or granite panels. Um, and it's a very calming space to walk through. Um, and you often will see people crying. They, you may, you'll see people that maybe have a family member whose name is on the wall or a Vietnam veteran whose uh, fellow soldiers names are on the wall. And a lot of times people will take a, like a piece of paper and a number two pencil and they'll do like a, a rubbing or an etching so that they take back the name um, on a piece of paper with them from the wall. So next we have art as a form of self-expression and like I said earlier this is a 19th and much more of a 20th century idea. But what we're looking at here is Frida Kahlo, who has been regarded as probably the most self-expressionist artist of the 20th century. So as a young teenager, Kahlo was in an accident in a bus in Mexico. She's a Mexican-born artist. And the accident left her body very broken. Um, and so while she survived, she went through dozens of operations and she was basically in excruciating pain her most of her life. Um, so what we're seeing here in the broken column is that she has replaced her spine with a Greek column that has been broken into dozens of pieces. Um, we also see her skin covered in nails and tears falling from her eyes. And what, what we're seeing is that the artist is showing us in and using her art as a way of communicating her pain to others. Um, and it's very much this form of self-expression. And a lot of her paintings created throughout her life deal with the pain that she dealt, whether it be emotional pain from her marriage um, and subsequent divorce or her pain from her physical pain from the accident and the subsequent surgeries that followed. Okay, so here we have art um, that is serving a worship or ritualistic purpose. Um, so here we're looking at Saint Chapelle, which is a um, I lost my train of thought, which is a chapel in Paris. This was actually constructed as a royal chapel um, for the French king and his court. Um, so in this space, you're going to see it's covered in stained glass. Over 75% of the exterior wall is in fact stained glass. Um, and this was very revolutionary at the time um, because the, the metal pieces that hold the stained glass together are called tracery. And reducing the tracery as much as the architects and the workers here did um, there was a lot of concern when it was constructed that it may not withstand the weather um, and may not hold up. It did hold up and we still have it today. Um, and it's this absolutely magnificent space to walk through. It looks like this, you're, you're basically inside of a jewel box with all of the different colors from the stained glass with the sun shining in through. Um, the floor is painted in a series of motifs that are very important to the French monarch. Um, and you can see, 
you can barely see, there's niches on either side of the, the space. And this is where the thrones of the king and queen would have been. So this is where they would have sat during services. Okay, our next work here is art that is holding the sense of authority. Um, and we'll see this idea pop up again in our, uh, let's say, our Module 2 lecture with the elements of art. But here we have the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. And these strong vertical lines that run across the colonnades in the front, these are... These lines are very indicative of power and authority. And we see that in architecture. We also see that in paintings and in mosaics. Works that have these kind of repetitive uh, vertical lines in them tend to hold this kind of intrinsic authority and power in those specific pieces. Um, and this particular structure dates all the way back to ancient Greece. Um, with the temple dedicated to Athena. And we see from ancient Greece all the way up to when the Supreme Court building was constructed in 1980, this uh, kind of archetype has been repeated throughout history. We see buildings all over Europe and all over the U.S. Um, that use this type of architecture. Okay, so here we have a work that is dedica a dedicated way for artists for an artist to shock the viewer. And Marcel Duchamp does that not only in this piece, but in most of the works he created during his lifetime. So Duchamp is working in the 20th century. We can see he's in the early teens um, with this piece. And the title here is the inscription. So it's L-H-O-O-Q. So Duchamp... Um, actually purchased this is a set a satirical piece and it, he actually purchased a postcard um, of the Mona Lisa and he did this to poke fun at this work that's an icon of western um, history and the Mona Lisa was at the time and is still in some ways today this icon for western art so he's purchased a postcard was very controversial the fact that he purchased a postcard, he made adjustments to the figure of the Mona Lisa. So we can see the mustache, a goatee. He's made adjustments a little bit to the background and to her garments. Um, and he's passed it off as his own work of art. Um, and so for Duchamp, that became an issue for him with art critics and with the art world in general. The other issue that we see happening um, is with the inscription itself. Um, so if you read French or you know the French phonetic alphabet and you read each of those letters phonetically, it reads a sentence that translates roughly to she has a nice derriere. Um, and so the idea that he's inscribed the painting with this vulgar phrase was very controversial um, in the art world and a big kind of issue for artists and um, art critics and art historians in New York at the time. And we'll see in a, um, Duchamp shock artists throughout his entire career. Okay, so that is all for lecture one. Make sure that you are answering the um, the question prompt at the end of your notes um, because that is a big, that's a automatic two points off if you fail to do that. So make sure you uh, include that with your notes before you submit them.